everybody, welcome to Absolutely... Oh, no, I forgot what it was. I was like, Absolutely Marvel and no. Hey, everybody, welcome to Absolute Comics. I am your host, Sal, and I'm joined today by DJ Woolrich from Only Stupid Answers. What? Benny's down. What up? <laughs> what is happening? Right? Oh, my God. If you have never seen DJ, I don't know what planet you're on, but it is not Counter-Earth or Earth. You should check out DJ over Only Stupid Answers on YouTube.com. Uh, check it out, man. Yeah, come check me out. Come, yeah. come find, why haven't you seen me? It's true. What do you? So, uh, should we? Are we going to plug you? What are, we, what are you doing here, man? Dude, well, okay. So for those that may not be familiar, um, we talked a little bit about this pre-show, but you can find me at Only Stupid Answers. That's the podcast I do every week where we talk about movies and TV shows and comics, uh, similar, you know, Venn diagram. But on uh, that show, on that channel, you can also check out a show I do with Sal called Spider-Versity. We do over patreon.com slash Only Stupid Answers and Mutant Academy, where we talk about the X-Men movies on youtube.com slash only stupid answers we just did logan um and yeah those are the those are the main things i also uh currently have a kickstarter if you go to gunplaymovie.com uh it is we're down to the wire and we got a ways to go uh, so <laughs> if you, you want to see it's got a lot of amazing people in it a lot of people uh, uh chipping in to try and make a movie we got steve zaragoza whitney moore brie asterisk roxy stry and a bunch of other amazing people so if you're like wow that sounds uh like it's up my alley now now is the time to, yeah. to go in and back it uh and maybe see if we can uh pick up some momentum before the last few days but yeah that's that's me there you have it. That's the seventh inning stretch we're coming to for uh, for gunplay. Steve Zaragoza from Sourcefed, Whitney Moore from friggin' Birdemic. Yeah, man. Yeah. If you are not a James Wen fan, I don't know what, what's going on. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, uh, but at least you know you know Whit Whitney shines from that movie. Uh, mm -hmm, it's the mm -hmm. only thing that was worth uh, seeing in that movie. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah I a lot of great talented people. So yeah, go true. check it out. Come play movie. Yeah. But listen, this is a comic book show. We're talking about comic books and comic book related media. So if you uh, are interested, let's jump into our topics for today. Uh, DC announced at Comics Pro that DC will finally be moving their new comic day to Wednesdays after being on Tuesdays since 2020. The swap over actually takes place officially this July. DJ. Yeah. You buy comics. Mm hmm. How did you feel about the DC the DC Tuesday situation that's been going on since the pandemic? Or well, did it even affect you? <laughs> it didn't really affect me because um, I moved a little bit away from my my comic shop of choice. So I don't tend to go every week because it's a little bit of a drive. Uh, yeah. So I tend to like, you know, wait till I build up some stuff in my little folder and then go get it. Also, my comic shop is closed on Tuesdays. Uh, what? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that's not true. That, that, that's fair because my comic shop did the same thing because comics come out on Wednesdays. Yeah. So they close on Tuesdays so mm -hmm. they can spend all day loading yeah. all the comics onto the shelves. So here's my question for you, Sal, that I hope maybe you can answer. Why Tuesday? Why did it become Tuesday? I, you know, uh, I, I remember vividly when it happened, and I remember DC giving a very fake answer as to yeah. why. Um, I, I want to say it's because of terrible management and an attempt to differentiate. Mm. Like, I, I genuinely think it was. I, I, no, oh, I'm sorry. It was the it was the distribution situation. Yeah. They switched distributors. They dropped Diamond, yeah. and they switched distributors. And the distribution situation forced them to have to release like either a day early or they have to go later. So they went with Tuesdays. Cause I want to say, I want to say that isn't Tuesdays when like new, I used to work at Barnes and Noble. I'm trying to mm. go back to those days. Yeah. It, isn't Tuesdays when I know that's when new albums drop. That tends to be Tuesday tends to be where other new things drop albums, books. Yes. I, I can't remember if it's Thursdays or Tuesdays of video games come out, but I remember it was a T yeah. day of the week when new video yeah. games came out. But I know it wasn't Wednesdays. And so it was cool. You could you go like, oh, pick up the new album on Tuesday, new comics on Wednesday, new video games on Thursday. Boom. Um, yeah. So, yeah, they, they changed the Tuesdays. And I, I, I'm wondering how, because everybody I talked to notoriously hated Diamond, or at least hated the Monopoly, the stranglehold right. they had over everything. Oh. And so I know when people started, because it was DC, and now I think, has Image moved away from Diamond too? I think I... pretty much everyone but like a, but a handful have dropped Diamond. But yes, I believe Image is moving away from Diamond if they haven't okay. already. So yeah, and, and, and Marvel's with Penguin. Yeah, okay, right on. Uh, and and so I kind of assumed that's a good thing, right? But then I, the feedback I was getting, I, maybe it was just because change is always challenging. Yeah. That it was like, yeah, we're finally moving away from down, Diamond and it sucks. It's like, but Diamond sucked. 
Also, you know, yeah. comic people are notoriously hard to please. So maybe, <laughs> maybe there's. Oh, not a- you're not wrong. No, yeah. I remember uh, hearing about the stranglehold that Diamond has had on the industry since I started reading comics. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I started becoming intimately familiar with the goings on, the inner workings of the industry, uh, only did I hear you know, resident frequencies being higher and louder about how Diamond sucked and about how Diamond was just ruining the monopolies and how, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm trying to remember the uh, the name of the um, the Marvel distribution house that like they bought that then Malibu caused. No, no, no. They bought Malibu, but they bought like they Marvel basically tried to become their their own distributor and uh, something that, by the way, they promised distribution houses and publishers and, and, and retailers they would never do. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. but anyway so yeah they uh i've been hearing about that forever and then the day it was announced that they were dropping diamond people were like i'm dropping dc comic shops that i know at least two yeah. large comic book stores that just don't carry new dc comics because of that decision it's so wild to me it's it, it's yeah. just the idea that like yeah, diamond sucks or they're not gonna use that anymore oh screw you and it's like well I'm what's still mad yeah you know, what's the solution then yeah. um I, and, I, and on one hand i get it and i think it, it it speaks to kind of like when you talk to people you know i'll talk to people sometimes where like i just wish everything was on netflix i'm like why <laughs> and i because it's and I, I assume this is maybe was the appeal of diamond at the time it is easier when everything is consolidated the problem is when you have a platform that is not performing uh, at the level you'd like it to, and there's no competition. Yeah, there's no reason for them to improve Hell what no. they're doing. Yeah. Well, and and you know, uh, and we've talked about this, I think, at length, but not on this show, so I'm able to repeat myself. But uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to Netflix and its model, yeah. which I know people in like television and movies are like, "Boo! It was never a model," and I'm like, "No, nah, there was a model there. Yeah. And the model was distribution. Netflix yeah. was a distribution house, a and distributor. When it, yep." when everybody submitted their shit for distribution, it was like, oh yeah, that's kind of awesome. You know, especially yeah. revolutionary when it was, when it was at first a mail order service, I got my DVDs or Blu-rays mm-hmm. and then I mailed them back and I got a fee if I didn't return them. Yeah. And then when it was a digital distributor, it was like, oh, that actually makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. And everybody got their beak wet. Everybody made a little bit of money, especially Netflix. Yeah. But when everybody got greedy and became their own distribution houses, which are, 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 oddly enough kind of connects with our diamond discussion, um, it caused Netflix to have to pivot from yeah. a distribution house to a content creation provider, which I genuinely don't think they're actually capable of doing. I, if it if it took them 20 years to to finally figure it out then they were never supposed to do it yeah you know well, that's an interesting point that i have and i'm thinking about doing a whole episode on netflix and its impact on media yeah uh, which is a larger conversation as I've, I've looked into it is a larger conversation about how tech the tech industry has has kind of disrupted for lack of a better word pretty much every industry in ways that i don't know that are are beneficial but i've never thought about it in the context of and i do i feel like we're still kind of on topic so when i go on tangents but i actually feel like this is still kind of on topic i I Um, do too i'm like i'm like this is going really well so far (laughs) yeah i think i think this idea that the if maybe this idea that you can't be a production house and a distribution you, you splitting that up, you know what I mean? Yeah. Having some place like net and I, not just Netflix. Um, I actually am quite fond of of Hulu mostly because they got all FX, uh, yeah. and FX has been a pretty solid provider of media that I enjoy for the past decade plus. A couple plus decades. They've got the point. they've they've got a good format, right? Mm-hmm. And and it's it's not exactly it's not a carbon copy of Netflix, nor is yeah. it a carbon copy of any of the other Disney, Disney Plus, etc. Yeah. Like Hulu was live tv it was uh major networks it was there was a delay in release yeah Th- there yeah. was actually like a like a thought that went into it feels like hulu was generated by people from television whereas netflix was generated by people who ran a warehouse yeah and it was yeah it's more tech based it's more t- more of a tech company but but breaking up that idea of like okay you guys because because as different platforms have, fo- have focused more on their distribution models the content has suffered yes you know, which yeah. is, that's, that's interesting. That's a very interesting. And I don't know. So, so right now kind of trying to loop it back to this, the comic thing, we've got Marvel's at Penguin. 
do we know off the top of our head who DC went with? I don't remember. Any. Oh, Lunar and uh, okay. I know it's I know it, it is I think pretty much only Lunar, but I remember it was Lunar and somebody else basically by coastal distribution houses. One of which, and I remember this is a big problem, and that's part of the reason why most uh, comic book stores dropped DC and out of protest. One of them was Midtown Comics. So like a direct national competitor oh, yeah. for every local comic book store was also distributing comic books, yeah. which is exactly part of our conversation where it's like, there's a conflict of interest when you are a distribution house and also a production company, yeah. because you're going to have a vested interest in distributing your content. When it's also, it's, it's challenging to, in general, it's challenging to be good at multiple things. Uh, and I'll say in, in the scales are completely different. So it's probably asinine for me to even bring this up, but yeah. typically I do Kickstarters for comics. And so, and unfortunately because of budgetary reasons, I'm also my distributor. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I wish I could farm that. I wish I got enough money to farm that out, but I'm also the one doing it. Yeah. Um, and it is obviously the, the part I like least other than the reward of getting it in people's hands, that's pretty cool. But it's also incredibly stressful and incredibly expensive. Um, but yeah, it's so this idea of, uh, yeah, this idea of splitting it up. I know we're, again, we're talking about comics. Unfortunately, the comic, you know, Marvel is not its own distributor. DC is, is not its own distributor. But I think this is one of the rare instances that other media outlets could look at what comics does and like, yeah, maybe you shouldn't be your own distributor. Absolutely. It's a different skill set. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think it's yeah. it, well, it's a different skill set. It's a different uh, staff. It's yeah. a different uh, econ economy, and uh, and you just you need to have a different kind of muscle strength in order yeah. to distribute versus produce. And Netflix was like, "You got it. You nailed it. All right, yeah. you nailed the, the the format everyone everyone wanted or everyone thought they wanted when there was less content." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, because uh, now, now I'm just for the show that we're doing this week I'm just watching the new Avatar The Last Airbender show yes. uh, and it is cripplingly mediocre it is like yeah. very down the road and it's one of those like yeah maybe if you had part of if the separation between creative and logistical not that the people making the Avatar show are also you know the ones in bed with Netflix, yeah, well, yeah, the ones like uh, putting it up on on the Netflix site or whatever. Yeah. But you know, there's very much conversations about how is it going to do on the platform. Um, is this is this uh, our bread and butter? Is making stuff that people watch while they fold their laundry. So we've got to have characters exposit what's happening every like ten minutes uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know and, and it's and i think it you're, you're crossing your streams a little bit and yeah kind of definitely muddying waters interesting yeah. but anyway long story short i am sure i'm glad dc's back on wednesdays again you know if people are going in for a specific day have it all be at the same time there were so many retailers who didn't drop dc that just went okay dc comes out on tuesdays well i'm gonna put them out on wednesday yeah because i'm not gonna do two full days of releasing yeah um I remember one, my my then local shop, what they would do is they would get all the DC books and put them into, I think the way a couple of these retailers that worked out, they put all their new releases into like a long box because they had to get yeah. them from these boxes that, of course, you know, mm -hmm. got damaged in shipping and whatnot. But they put them in long boxes and then put the long boxes up next to the shelves and then like just put them out, you know, in order. Yeah. And uh, what they would do is they just put them in the long boxes and then keep the long boxes behind the register. Yeah. So if on Tuesday you knew what book you wanted from DC, you would ask for it and they'd hand it to you, yeah. but they're still going out on the shelf tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was already like a, I mean, I, and I don't think it was a deliberate decision. I think it was more of like a, a mental gymnastics of the marketing department to go, uh, we can't, we can't feasibly release the books on Wednesday. It's not how the two distributors work. So, yeah just spin it so yeah. that it sounds like it was a deliberate decision mm -hmm. and then further alienate our client base. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm happy to hear that they're changing it. You know, this and other uh, good news from DC makes me think like there was some kind of changing of the guard or some kind of like release valve that was pulled in the form of like an obstinate entrenched thing in the way. And that thing could yeah. be a person or some kind of weird protocol because we noticed that uh, things started smooth, moving smoother at Marvel when Ike Perlmutter went away. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that was happening at DC. Um, speaking of DC, I noticed also that DC apparently has announced the next crossover is coming up called Absolute Power, where Amanda Waller will be teaming up with female Brainiac and Failsafe from Batman 
to rob metahumans of their superpowers. The prologue will release on Free Comic Book Day, May 4th, 2024. Do we know who's uh, writing the event? Mark Wade. Oh, wow. Yes. Did, it he, is do, a, did he do uh, Lazarus Planet? Uh, that was also, yeah, Mark Wade also wrote Lazarus Planet. How uh, was that one? It was as good as all of the like weird mid season DC events. Yeah. Cause it didn't feel Fine. like, May. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I will say hearing that Mark Wade's writing it uh, and you know, Mark Wade's been working for decades. So yes. some of his stories are more, you know, like kingdom come is an all timer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I will say his current world's finest Batman Superman is like, Mwah, I love it's it. Like one of the best things coming out of like, the main superhero universe at DC right now. Yeah. And granted a large part of that is also Dan Mora. Uh, not that if he it, does. <laughs> if it looked like ass, it would be like the 10th best book, yeah, but it's but still really one of the greatest superhero artists working right now on it. And it's like, mm, this is good Keep stuff. Him happy. Give him a, and it's like, dude, Dan Mora has not needed a break from mm -hmm. Batman Superman in a long time like he yeah. will occasionally need to take a take a breath but it's not like a season long breath it's mm -hmm. like he'll take an issue off and then oh. he'll be back with a vengeance and there's no uh quality to dip so it's like yo put him on an event get it out there you know maybe sell a couple of trade paperbacks of batman superman world's finest because that book is amazing yeah uh, and and yeah and i think it makes it makes a lot of sense of course this is also like teasing up or teeing up from the williamson led uh i i think joshua williamson led uh dawn of dc period at at dc yeah where it's like amanda waller was set on the board uh through dark crisis as kind of like this i've changed my uh, opinion it's not like uh nick fury and the marvel characters where it's like almost adversarial but also like there's a mutual respect amanda waller never had any respect for the dc heroes but also yeah. would occasionally work with them like they'd ha you'd see mm -hmm. quiet clandestine handshakes with amanda waller and some costume character hell even williamson's green arrow book right now the the one that came out this week uh yeah. green arrow and amanda waller are in cahoots or at least seemingly in cahoots um so we're still seeing that but like she's taking a more active role in the like basically she's like it, it, these crises need to stop and it's all the costumes fault let's stop them i love it uh, and i think a waller is one of one of those dc characters that I, I, again we talk about all timers i think amanda waller is up there uh for me because there's nobody else in the big two superhero universes quite like Amanda Waller. And it's exactly for the reasons where you're talking about where, and, and I think a good part of it, Waller's always been great, but I think for my generation um, and a little bit younger, you know, Justice League Unlimited and what they oh. did with Waller and the fact that like, she is one of the few characters that is not a villain. You're right. 100% stand toe to toe with Batman and be like, yeah. no, I, it's me. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> there is a there, there is a classic. I want to say it was uh, Ostrander Suicide Squad issue yeah. that depicts like Waller. She's like a full foot or two shorter than Batman, mm -hmm. with her finger in his face, just yep. like giving him the business. And it's like that yep. is what Amanda Waller is in the DC universe. Yeah, because Nick Fury, yeah. like you're talking about, Nick Fury is a superhero functionally. Like uh, he, he doesn't takes the he takes yeah. the Infinity Formula. He lives forever. Like he's no, yeah. you're a superhero. He is a Nick super Fury. spy. He is, you know what I mean. He's a spy character. Uh, just like we talked about this the other day. As much as Captain America: Winter Soldier is a spy movie, Nick Fury is a spy character. But he is yes. one of the heroes. That is not Waller, but she's not a villain either. She's no. just a, an incredibly pragmatic character and it's one of the things i'm glad with this new reboot of the dcu the movies you know there's been some question of like who we're we keeping who we're we not keeping it yeah. does feel like a lot of james gunn's favorites are being kept which is weird but the one it's, that i don't think yeah. should have ever been a question is like yeah you keep viola davis as waller that's yeah. a no-brainer just like you keep you kept judy dench as m when you switched <laughs> over to Daniel craig like viola davis you're not that's that's it viola davis as waller yeah that's the winning ticket you keep that no, um, I agree. So I, I'm interested. I, I saw in the comments that apparently maybe Dan Moore is also doing art on this event, which probably means I will be. This is the first event in a while I will actually pick up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, That's right. So we'll see. What do you not to get us off on a tangent? Do, yeah, no. you, I was just saying about this other day. I've been reading uh, Grant Morrison's Super Gods book, which I think came out all the way back in like 2012 or something. It's, it's, Definitely. It's, it was a while ago. Yeah, yeah, it was a while ago. And for those that are not familiar, uh, it's part history of the comic book industry and part autobiography. Yep. And it's been interesting to see 
the way Grant Morrison breaks down the eras, and it's got me thinking about uh, where we're at. Oh it's yeah, like uh, I'm at the part of the book where where they are kind of talking about the the Renaissance era. We're coming mm -hmm. out of you know kind of the dark and gritty age, and so I when I think of that, I think early 2000s. I'm thinking people like Grant Morrison, Jeff Johns. Mark Wade, yeah. Uh, you, over at Marvel, you're thinking about books like Civil War, Brenda, Bendis, and Secret Event or New Avengers and stuff like that. Yep. And I, are we like in a slump period? Like, or are we, or maybe I'm, <sighs> am I not reading the room right? No, I think you're reading the room. It's just like you know, it's harder to pin down what you would categorize this period of. Yeah. I mean, when people refer to the modern age of comics when does that really extend to right? Like okay. 1986 to now that's impossible. The silver no. age is shorter. How is that? How are we making, managing to square that circle? But even, uh, you know, putting aside like naming it, yeah. uh, just, just compartmentalizing it. Absolutely. Whatever the modern age is, uh, should be the like name of the, of the, of the period. But once it has passed or once we have a clear declination of what that period is, we got to We got to put a brand on it. Um, yeah. Unless we want to move past it and go, no, the modern age of comics was this period. Yeah. When, when oh. modern, when comics became modern, although I don't know what that would mean in like a, you know, 30 years removed from it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I kind of like the way they break it down in the book, which is, uh, and I'd never really thought of this way, which I think is why it's on my mind. So it's like, you know, golden age, silver age, the dark age, which was like Watchmen up through the nineties. Yeah, that's fair. Like that. I like that a lot. And then, when I, and I'm just getting into this part, so I don't. I, I'm assuming it's this, but this Renaissance era being like the early 2000s, and and we start getting the movies, and so there's much more cultural saturation with these stories, and we've got yes. some of the best events we've ever had. You know, I'm thinking Sinestro Cold War. Uh, I have mixed feelings about Civil War event, but it's obviously a very popular event and influential and super influential. Um, but you know, when you start getting into stuff like. And, and I know uh, there's a lot of love for Dark Crisis and there's a lot of things I liked about that, but it is another, it's Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths. And it feels, and, and then just before that was, you got Scott Snyder with like, we're facing literally the creator of the universe. And it's, and, yeah. and so I kind of wonder like, once you've done, once like you've done it all. Yeah. You, where you're, you know, rebooted the universe like three times within the span of like five years. Yeah. I, you know, I just kind of wonder where you go, how you reset, you know, you know, where I, there's a lot of promise. Like I'm, this event sounds exciting. Um, yeah. I would say uh, Hickman's ultimate Spider-Man has been very exciting so far. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I, I don't know. I was just, it, it just got me thinking about there's such an explosion in the two thousands yeah. and just like, I do think, I, you know, I get pushed back on this from some of our peers, but I do think superhero fatigue is a thing. And I do think mm. people are feeling it to a certain degree. And I do think that translates to the comics as well. But I kind of wonder, you know, these this has been around for over a century. Kind of these kind of superhero comics have been around over the century. Yeah. There's ups and there's downs and there's what and so I kind of wonder what the next we talked about this the other day, and that's why I'm bringing this up is when it comes to events, you don't go bigger than fighting the creator of the universe and blowing that person up or what? Oh yeah. Involved. I don't, I don't yeah, remember. No, like if, if God can, if God is revealed to be a super villain yeah. who can literally whip Elseworlds planets at her opponent, who yeah, is, yeah, yeah. who is a merging of a Batman and Dr. Manhattan from Watchmen. Yeah. You've essentially just, you've exhausted your resources. Yeah. Um, and and so where do you go from there? It, it it also I think is reflective of another problem, which actually, um, I did an interview with Todd McFarlane the other day, and uh, it came out today. And and one of the things that he pointed out, one of his big problems with the industry overall, is the constant reboots. And when he says reboots, he doesn't mean like um I'm in relaunches, like not like a like like a new fifty two, but rather like a just just keep making number one, new number ones, yeah, because because. Essentially, the big two, like every time that like a new number one comes out, there's a spike in sales, but then the spike gets lower. And then the next time you do it, you do get a spike, but that spike is still lower than the last spike. Mm -hmm. Like you're still going down slope. Yeah. And in addition to and I think that that is the reason why it is on a downward if it is in a downward trajectory. Part of the reason why the refreshes don't help is because people's fatigue in the in in the like the metaphorical refreshes 
that's happening in the stories where it's like, oh, it's time for Batman to have another partner or it's time for Batman to have his origin retold or, you know, or, or any number of characters get another refresh. But also you're rebooting the numbers. It, It's just you're not necessarily fatiguing people of superheroes. You're more fatiguing people of the problem we talked about before the show started, which is the immediate gains. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all about immediate gain. And that is exhausting your audience because your audience can only like take so many reboot like i i i did the same uh math when it was talking about crises right like mm -hmm. crisis on infinite earths was 86 it was necessary because we were yeah. like we were like we need to because more or less because the dc explosion of books was an implosion and we needed to refresh our line and get people excited about this effing universe again but you know we we created a story out of our publishing initiative cool mm -hmm. neat idea first time yeah then 10 years later they do zero hour and i remember when zero hour came out and there being articles in wizard magazine from the creators of it and they're basically like we don't really need a reboot but it's been 10 years so let's let's do a like kind of crisis yeah. that pays homage to or at least deference to the crisis we had like a victory lap and yeah. it was terrible and boring and unhelpful and did not set things better because they created like a timeline that had firm dates on it which is something you can't do in a mm -hmm. shared universe that doesn't reboot but my point being all the crises happen in closer conjunction with each other it was like oh it was 10 years then it was five years and it was two years and it's like just because you don't necessarily call them crises death metal is a crisis dark knights yeah. metal is a crisis like heroes in crisis is an identity crisis like these crises yeah. still happen and they happen in rapid succession and in shorter spans of time and so as a result like you're just making your audience go like oh my god like number one i'm 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 pavlovianly exp like conditioned to expect a crisis mm -hmm. and sooner yeah. which makes me less invested in my universe because I know a crisis around the corner. Yeah, and, and I think it messes with your willing suspension of disbelief. This isn't a natural outgrowth of the story you're telling. You can feel as an audience member, and I feel like because uh, the comic readership is inherently so niche compared to something like movies, Big time. Uh, they're probably a little bit more dialed into that kind of business thing. I will say about this, absolute power, good thing they didn't call it absolute crisis, absolute power. Oh. Yeah. Absolute power crisis. No, I, I, it does sound a more, it's not the multiverse. It's just, and, and, it, and it does feel character focused in that if you talk, so you're telling me Amanda Waller is like, yeah, what if we got rid of all these powers? That sounds like something Amanda Waller would think and do. That's, totally. <laughs> that, sounds, yeah. that sounds in line. Yeah. So it's just tough. It, it's tough. It's also tough with events because there's not a good way. I mean, what's one of the most iconic things? two of the most iconic things that came out of crisis on finite earths mm. the death, uh, of the death, of and, and death of barry allen you know what i mean yeah, yeah but now it's because of that interconnectivity and and not just that but interconnectivity between the comics and the movies themselves yeah it is harder for any sense of closure or finality or meaningfully changing the story occasionally you get like i didn't read Lazarus Planet, but it did give me directly out of that came the Unstoppable Doom Patrol book, which I liked quite a bit. I, I liked yeah, yeah, it yeah. a lot. So eventually, sometimes you'll get like a relaunch of a book or something that uh, that an event will give you. And I'm not necessarily anti events, but I remember the the I would pick up number ones, and I normally wouldn't, you know, keep up with them unless they really gripped me. But the one that really got me, and I was like, I need to stop even picking up number ones, was um, King in Black. Because oh, yeah. there's a plot point, I've mentioned this, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned on this show, but like uh, King in Black, they, to try and stop the King in Black, there's a there's a debris field of Kree ships from the event that just happened three months ago. Yes. That they blow up. And it's like, you can't remind me that there was an earth shaking event just three months prior. Yeah, I think that's funny. I like that because that was, I think, taking the piss. I think that was like deliberately like... Yeah, there was. A, remember that event that you forgot about because it was not nearly as cool as King in Black. Yeah. Well, let's use the debris yeah. from it as a plot point in the event you're actually reading. I, I yeah. feel like that was a dig. Yeah, maybe, but it was just one of those. It was just for me. Again, but it, it pulled once, back the curtain it, for you. It, yeah. It's like, yeah, these events happen every couple months, and it's like I don't. It's hard for me to care because because I think you know you and I are probably in the same boat. You cover comics more specifically, so maybe this isn't career career wise. You can't do this as much, but I pick up writers. I pick up, you know, um, I didn't know about Jed. I wasn't familiar with Jed McKay's work, but I was a Moon yeah. Knight fan, so it's like New Moon Knight. I'll check it out. 
and now I'm a Jim McKay fan. I'm like, this Moon Knight run rips. It's great. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and so, you know, I, I love Dan Moore's work. Um, I tend to like Mark Waits. So I'll pick up World's Finest. Great. You know, so so uh, it's it's tougher to hook me with an event. And I've been burned so many times. Like, I was really yes. disappointed. I think the last event I bought every issue of was Heroes in Crisis. And as a Wally West fan, I didn't really like the direction that went. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, well, you are not alone. On, yeah. Uh, the, the universal, uh, what is the opposite of a claim? Yeah. That uh, Heroes in Crisis received, uh, myself included. Yeah, it's tough. It's just, events are tough. Events are, it, and it's kind of a thankless, like Mark Wade, you know, this is, Mark Wade can probably write an event in, in his sleep at this point. No but question. For every for anybody else, it's like, what a, what a tricky thing, especially in this era where there's so many events like i almost oh, envy yeah. the zero the, the fact that the zero hour guys were like yeah it's been a decade why not do another one it's like that's actually not an instinct i hate <laughs> no it's true yeah yeah like hey, yeah, it's been a long years. time yeah exactly yeah. waiting 10 years is actually kind of amazing the restraint they had but even then they had like you know maybe it's the anything goes era because at this point finding a person who has any restraint working in the comic book mm -hmm. industry is hard yeah. You know, just being like, uh, you know, the the idea of like Bendis getting pushback about putting Spider-Man on the Avengers, mm -hmm. you know, was was a universal story that he told about how, yeah. you know, people are like, boo, what? Like he got yeah. resistance. Whereas now it's like, can you imagine being in a Marvel or DC writer's room and then pitching an idea and getting any pushback about anything at, at this all. point? Like, I, Yeah, the Avengers are now I remember one of the things that kind of for me as a fan always distinguish Avengers from Justice League is every DC character the Justice League didn't other than like maybe and this wasn't even necessarily true in the 90s other than maybe like Batman Superman and Wonder Woman yeah everybody had been on the Justice League at some point or whatever whereas the it's Avengers had like a set in my mind had a, had a relatively set roster and now it's like it's the same thing every i think every marvel character has been an avenger at some point maybe dark hawk has it maybe definitely no it's true it, it is harder to find a character who has not been an avenger or member of the justice league yeah than was yeah and uh yeah man no it's true uh Moving on to our next topic, uh, Marvel has announced a line of free comics called Marvel's Must Haves, which mm -hmm. will be an anthology of one shots that compile multiple issues into a single com. It's a Shonen Jump. Uh, yeah. These must haves are older comics being re-released under this free title and will include 2016 Spider-Man Deadpool number one by Joe Kelly. Great. I wonder why. Uh, 2023's Immortal Hulk number two by Al Ewing and Ms. Marvel, the new mutant number one. Marvel's announcement re read, uh, quote, these free issues collect multiple iconic issues issues that spotlight the marvel characters and comic book series currently at the forefront of pop culture these stories are handpicked and act as perfect jumping on points for new readers i say great any attempt mm -hmm. to, to to do anything other than what they normally do to get new readers is uh should be met with healthy skepticism but universal acceptance so do you i i, I don't know if you know beyond um, just that like press release. And so if I wanted one of these free issues, is it just going to be on the shelf of my comic shop? Yeah. Your comic gonna... store. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm with you on that one. 100% because I, and I think it's something the comics industry has needed to get better at for a long time. And mm -hmm. it's unfortunate. We just had all these superhero movies and they were not really able to capitalize on getting the audiences to check that stuff out. But I, no. I do think stuff like you just said that what, what I really keyed off of is you mentioning is just like Shonen jump. And it's like that, they need to do more of that stuff. Yeah, is absolutely. look at what other people um, like. I think DC's. I, I don't read these because I'm not the target audience, but it seems like DC's had a lot of success with those young adult graphic novels. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Regardless of what uh, some might tell you on YouTube, uh, those books sell, and yeah, good. Uh, they're selling because they're selling to the demographic they are geared towards. G. Willikers. I wonder why a 50 year old man would not read I Am Not Starfire. Yeah, uh, and it's, and it's not, not made even a for point. That. Like we all fell in love with this stuff. Like Sal, when was your first comic? Do you right. remember? My, like what? What was my first comic? Or when? Like when? when? Like, like how, how old, old was I? You? Yeah, I was probably like eight. Yeah, eight to ten. I remember. I I remember vividly. The first comic I really remember buying was we would go to like. It was in Arizona and it was like a flea market. It was like an outdoor flea market. Totally. Yeah. Into this trailer and that's where I got my first. And it was the introduction of of ben riley spider-man oh wow that or really scarlet is. spider excuse me it was when he was right. introduced to scarlet spider okay and uh so for anybody that's like why does dj love ben riley so much it's like well there's here's your answer right there uh yeah. i've got a long history with the character um 
but it's it and we and it's this is not to say like poo poo you know we're we're both 30 plus or whatever you know yeah. people loving these stories and comics is a medium Mm -hmm. can tell a variety of incredible stories there's been a big boom in horror recently i yep. know one of my favorite books right now is local man which is obviously targeted towards people of my generation but yeah. for superhero stories in particular not, not to be dismissed they're kids they're for kids they're kids you know what i mean like that's it's right. guys in colorful costumes punching space gods like that's the thing there's it's a reason why children react to them positively it's it's yeah. why they use primary colors like because it is attractive and eye-catching to children like that's they were designed to mm -hmm. be uh at, at child height and mm -hmm. reachable yep. and and, yep. and attractive to them you know so yes i mean like not to say the comics are for kids or are diminished in any way just simply comics were engineered superhero comics capes and tights comics were engineered for children to want them and if you love superhero comics and you want that genre to continue to grow and evolve you're going to want younger generations to have access to them and that's another reason yeah. why um i loved the new my adventures with superman show right. animated animated series so much as i could imagine like i imagine if i had a kid or or somebody of you know eight or ten and this is their first exposure to superman it's like what a great introduction because there's so there's it's it and and again it's exactly what we're talking about it's using the formats that that generate like anime you know my adventures yeah. with superman is very inspired by anime and it's using that language to tell the story that at this point guys like you and I know by heart in a way that's accessible to new audiences. And I'm actually, a, I, I'm a big supporter of it. So if these free issues, it, it does feel like a weird, because the spectrum between Spider-Man and Deadpool to uh, Miss Marvel, New Mutant, it's like, well, that's different. Yeah, that's, Eras, it's, a, it's it's a different right, like, like who <laughs> is that for specific like, you know, and it's the same format. So it's like, well, who are you trying to get? And they're like, anybody. I think I think honestly, it's like just a desperate like. I mean, whoever wants to buy the damn thing, honestly, like that's yeah. Because like one of the things that I, I I learned in some in doing some research recently, I was talking about this, and I, I will talk about this probably for the next couple of years. Is um, this like observation I made recently about comics and the industry and how like it just doesn't make enough money. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it it doesn't make enough money, and it never will and rather than like take that as a as an l why not take that as an opportunity to like focus or refocus yeah. you know like i uh what was it kevin eastman when he uh became a millionaire overnight for creating mm -hmm. uh, the ninja turtles uh you know peter layer's like let's make more ninja turtles and kevin eastman's like yeah yeah, yeah but i want to like revolutionize the like black and white comics independent yeah. industry and pumped in upwards of and this is an alleged number but 14 million dollars to a thing that they that they closed and didn't work yeah or was ultimately reabsorbed by somebody else yeah and it's like literally like saying oh i'll just throw like if i wish i were a millionaire because then i just i just fix all the problems in the industry or or, or I'd, I'd figure out a campaign that would get people to read comic books no you won't yeah. it's like there have been millionaire benefactors who have attempted to get comics into the hands of like even just getting independent black and white comics into the hands of regular comic book readers or getting mainstream comics into the hands of anyone yeah. and the money has been spent the, the the market research unfortunately has not been collected by people who actually have degrees in market research mm -hmm. uh, but we have people who uh at least can like live and breathe and understand you know object permanence and friggin nuance and so like on one hand you know, like, oh, uh, will the industry implode or will, uh, you know, if, if like if the next Marvel movie doesn't work out like, well, it didn't when there weren't any mm -hmm. and uh, it didn't explode when the movie made a billion dollars. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe comics are just on one trajectory and it doesn't really matter what all the other multimedia does. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting. It is an interesting it is an interesting query. And I, and I wonder if part of the reason you know as long as i've been alive yeah comics have been so insular like I absolutely remember, I, another vivid memory i have this was probably maybe high school maybe early college i remember this was the beginning of i started getting wanting to get back in the comics because so, we're right around iron man dark knight uh, totally. and um 
I don't know, you know, things have blended together in my brain. So we're right. Iron Man and Doc Knight came out in the same year, same like season. Yeah, but I don't remember when New Avengers. I want to say that's it's pre Iron Man by a couple of years. That yeah. predates Iron Man yeah. by a few years. But anyway, I remember that's happening because that that was like uh that was like crack spider-man's on the avengers spider-man and wolverine are on the avengers oh, oh dang suddenly i care about this team that i never did before and mm -hmm. but i remember so i went to a local comic shop in florida and they were like blasting hentai in the back room. Like i could hear no! it in the back room and it was just one of those and it was immediately like oh never mind i don't want to be you know what i mean um and 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 i think that's and obviously that's not uh the norm yeah that's not the norm and it's not but it but i do remember the the barrier to entry through comic shops they've gotten a lot better at it but especially then was very challenging because these are people that didn't want new people there like yeah. weirdly like, like no get out of here this oh absolutely my friends um oh yeah oh you can see it in, in every discourse about comics today uh, i mean like there was a huge conversation recently regarding like a, a a youtuber retailer and people being like this is changing the way we're looking at it and like it was it was starting a lot of conversations and it was just like yeah people are still people are still like i don't want them in my hobby yeah, you're going to because you're going to change it. I think that I think that the like, I don't think that there is a desire to see people not enter the hobby. I think it's from a place of like protection. They're like, I don't want enough. I, you know, I don't want diversity in my in my in my space because then I'll have to change. Yeah. And I think but and I think that's the, the thing people in general, I feel like don't understand about diversity is that's the way just in general no matter what you're talking about that right. is a healthy way for your thing to grow if you love a thing allow it to grow and allow it to change and i it do keeps think it from getting yeah it keeps yeah. you from getting uh incest like it's, yeah it, it, it's how you it, it's literally how the gene pool keeps going <laughs> and so just to get get back to like this free issue thing and even if they were to reformat i actually think there might be merit in reformatting some of these comics so they are manga size and you can put yeah. in you know what i mean and I, obviously i don't know how the i'm not a manga reader so i don't know how that audience would respond to that but it's one of those if that's the stuff that sells like we were talking about with the ya graphic novels if that's the yeah. stuff that sells that's a good way because because here's what got me the things that got me back in the comics oh geez. were grant morrison's batman r.i.p uh -huh. um because dark that was when dark knight was out they're killing off bruce wayne what's this about and that was my first yeah. exposure to grant morrison's work and so it's like he's having conversations with batmite about the nature of the fifth dimension i'm like what is this and totally and uh brian azarello and Libra mejo's joker graphic novel. oh yeah and that was my like oh this is art and you can right. have both you know what i mean you can have your introductory stuff for both can exist in this medium you know, yeah. you can have your introductory stuff for people that, you know, maybe are younger, just want to dip their toes, you know, with unburdened with decades of myth mythology and stuff that yep. you have to keep, keep up with. And then once they get into that stuff, then you can start branching out and like, okay, well, so what's this about? What's this writer about all this stuff? And, and I think that makes it a healthier environment. And maybe again, the comic shop I go to is, is fantastic. I, but see, I'm lucky. I live in LA. So I, comic book store, yeah, I, I, I love saying, I love dropping my comic uh, book house of secrets in Burbank. Um, hey, I know them. Yeah. yeah. There's a bunch of, there's a bunch of great shops. You know, I, it's a major city. So I've got, I, I love that I'm shop. Embarrassed you're, you're not, you're not doxing yourself, but yeah, it's a, uh, no. No, I love that shop. I, I went there, ironically enough, when DC sent us out to like do their timeshare for DC Universe's app. Yeah. Uh, I was like, literally my wife and I arrive, we go to a hotel in Burbank and mm -hmm. uh, our, our meetup was like at six and we got there at like noon and I went on my phone and I went local comic book stores and House, House Secrets was yep. five minutes up the road and we, we Ubered up there and uh, it was great. And I was well, yeah, like, when I first... a cool shop. Yeah, when I first uh, when I first came out here, we drove into Burbank, and I was and I'd been we'd been on the road for like a week. I'm like, I need to get my comics. Same thing, <laughs> looked up local shop, uh, House Secrets, and it's been my shop ever since uh, I've been out here. It's an easy um, shop to be. Yeah, because I've been to another. There's another shop in that area, and uh, I didn't like it as much. Yeah, there's there's a lot, but you know, again, and, and so I don't want to I don't want to like uh, laud my privilege of living in a major city and having a lot of different shops. That even where I live now, there's a shop down the street that I really like. I just yeah. House of Secrets has been my home for a long time. So that's I keep going there. Um point being that and 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 that's an easy shop to go into and they're very welcoming and they're and but I do think in some ways the barrier to entry to this stuff is too high. So anything they can do to make it more accessible for people, because the stuff I love about the medium isn't going anywhere. You know yeah. what I mean? It's not the it almost to almost to like a negative degree where there's stuff that I'm like, yeah, it's guys, it's time to switch things up, man. Right. 
it's a, it is okay if Peter Parker's married. And I mean, <laughs> we're doing that in Ultimate. I, I'm st- I'm just still salty that it's not happening in the six one six universe. Like I got to go to a whole another universe to see Peter Parker happily married with a family. <laughs> uh, I seriously, and it yeah. has to be in a place that is not actually the United States of America. And there's also like a clandestine group of people who are running everything. And like it's just like there's it's a lot great. of like I just wish it was six one six years old. It's just and- like yeah, I want I I want to see that world. Like and yeah. honestly, like when I was uh, when I got back back into comics because I got out of comics i went back i got out most, like, of the, I, I, most of the people in our generation you know we wanted to talk to girls and stuff like that so you're like maybe i need to dish this whole uh, maybe i gotta drop it thing. yeah comics made it easy though comics will always give you a jumping off point because yeah. uh i remember like i the only book i was reading at it for a time and it was during the time when i was looking for girls was spawn yeah. mm-hmm. i was like oh i'll read spawn because for one thing it only comes out every two every two or three months and yeah. for another uh i can hide them easier mm-hmm and uh but like marvel made it easy for me to drop spider-man because they because they always do yeah and uh so i did but um but when i got back it was because i was like i was getting older and now i don't mean i mean like i was getting older i mean like i was out of my teens Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i went and i was looking for things that were like you know whether i knew it or not stepping stones into the next phase in my life and suddenly straczynski was like here is spider-man your favorite character and you heard through wizard and stuff that his wife died in a plane crash, but actually she was alive and they were separated, but now they're back together. And I don't know if you know this, Sal, but comics are being written more like TV and stuff. So Mm -hmm. the characters don't say things like zones. They say things like, holy crap. Yeah. You're not uh, like open flipping it open. And there's like, 55 caption boxes oh my Why god is this interior monologue what's happening <laughs> yeah it's written by like you know the creator babylon 5 who has yeah. like an idea about uh character and story structure and so uh it really appealed to my sensibilities and g willikers also there was bendis and mm-hmm. so it was like these two who and you have to understand folks like i know that the second you say bendis either you're going to say something about like his terrible superman run or whatever or you're going to make like a Bendis? You mean Brian Michael Bendis? The creator Bendis? The writer Bendis? Like you make people in comics love to diminish people who have created things they love. And yeah. uh, when it comes to Bendis, it's like, yeah, Bendis made some mistakes. But like, if you compare Bendis to like the way comics are written today, yes, it seems dated and weird. But with nothing, yeah, you know, if you're comparing it to to what well, was going on on a regular going, basis, not the exceptional yeah. stuff, just the stuff that was going on in the background, it was like. This is innovative and, ch- and different. Well, I mean, I think you can you can trace like when you think about New Avengers and you think about Ultimate Spider-Man. Like I remember at the time, um, so this was probably late high school, early college. It, it was Marvel was trying this new initiative, of like, hey, you want to write for us? Submit a da 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 or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and I remember example, that. They, it was my first exposure to the idea of decompressed storytelling. Mm-hmm. That you know now one story is over six issue arcs because we want to sell them in trades. Uh-huh. Uh, and the, one of the examples I gave was like Ultimate. It was it was maybe this was pre Ultimate Spider Man, but uh, but it was Ultimate Spider Man. I feel like in a lot of Bendis's work helped revolutionize that. So yeah, I there's some stuff of uh, you know Bendis work that isn't my favorite, but yeah, New Avengers, Daredevil, Ultimate Spider Man, like it or not, like do change change the game for a lot of people. Um, yes. The other example I do want to point out, the other example they gave in that was, what was it called? They were trying this new line of, and it wasn't supposed to be super stuff, but it was like w- one of the flagship books of this new line, and I wish I could remember what it was told, called. Maybe somebody in the comics will be able to tell me. Yeah. But it was like we're gonna follow uh, Aunt May and and Mary Parker when they were. Oh, the nuff the nuff said line. You're talking about the ones where there was no dialogue. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't no dialogue, but it was like a teen. It was supposed to be like basically like Dawson's Creek, but it's like May Parker when she's a when she was a teen, and also secretly talking about trouble. She actually be. Peter's anyway whatever it was a different yeah, you're talking about, yeah that was that was uh i don't remember what it was called but it was done under under gemis and stuff it was it yeah. was trouble it was the worst and again uh, you know what yeah. try things i'm not again i'm not against trying things but but to your point you know when you talk about j michael straczynski bringing you back there's ups and downs and that's something i you know as much as i feel like i don't know that comics ex- there's some books i love like again i'm, st- I'm still loving uh, the new moon knight run i love local man uh the new deviant that book james tynan's deviant books were great i think um yeah, yeah. but uh, i don't necessarily get as excited 
for stuff like i'm not picking up events and stuff like that as i was yeah. maybe, maybe a decade ago but things go in cycles things go in stages and me and this might be somebody's this this is their era where they're finding this stuff for the first time and it and it might be one of those like we need a little bit of a refresh from you know maybe we don't do three events a year we you learn some lessons maybe we dial it back and and new fresh blood's able to come in and yeah. maybe with the you know as much as i love these superhero movies maybe the best thing that could happen to the genre is is superhero fatigue and so the mm -hmm. comics are less beholden to the movies they can kind of get back to maybe doing their own thing we get to have other movies other types of movies yeah. uh that are more mainstream that people are able to uh like and enjoy and stuff like that um yeah it'll be interesting and and i and it is uh I was just about ready to say something that was incredibly silly, which is like, yeah, maybe you know, superhero comics are losing their string, holding on the comic industry, like they're losing on movies. No, they're not. They never no. will. They never will. But, <laughs> but, but but the good news is there are a lot of other options in the medium. Like if you if you know where, like I don't know about your shop, Sal, but like you know, my shop has like two massive rows, Marvel and DC, and then the indie books are over there. But you know what I mean? Right. But they're there. And yep. the 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 Ed Brubaker reckless books are in a place of prominence, so you can go like pick those up whenever there's a new new one of those. Um, so I don't know. I think yeah. we started the office on absolute power. I'll probably check it out. <laughs> right? Yeah. No. Definitely. Um, oh no! This was in, the, sorry. This was the one shot. This, this is the Marvel. The this is like yeah, the yeah, Marvel. Good. Like I'm trying people. to pull in, pull in your yeah. readers. Get new people. Uh, but do it. Here, here's something more specific. Uh, after four years, Marvel is finally, finally bringing back Green Goblin. Two Spider-Man comics. He's been the Gold Goblin. He's been reformed. Uh, but, oh, that's uh, what because you sent this to me and you're like, finally, Green Goblin. Like, Where did he go away? Did, did right, yeah, no, something? he went. Well, he never like left, but he was. We haven't had any stories featuring a Green Goblin. Got it. In four years, uh, so Amazing Sp Spider-Man number fifty, uh, Norman's redemption arc comes to an end. I love that they're calling it a redemption arc. It's like mm -hmm. he was redeemed, and now it's over. Like it is coming mm -hmm. to an end in as much as he is no longer going to be redeemable yeah. um, if he ever was at all. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> we're getting Zeb Wells, Marv Wolfman, uh, et cetera, working on this. Ed McGinnis is going to draw it with Terry Dodson. Like it's, it's a big landmark issue with a lot of pages and, uh, and we're going to see Green Goblin come back. Uh, it, did it feel like four years? Yeah. I think it felt like a long time. It felt like they've been teasing it since he became a supporting cast member in the Amazing Spider-Man book. But Amazing Spider-Man, like the book, has done everything it can to take every bit of wind out of any sales they might have going for them. Yeah. And I, I, I mean that as a uh, both sales, S-A-I-L's and S-A-L-E-S. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, I don't care. Like, I, and I don't want to diminish anybody's good time. If you're excited about seeing it, I mean, honestly, like Ed McGuinness's Green Goblin is kind of dope looking. And I'm like, I'm here for a yeah. classic return of Green Goblin. But to quote a superhero who blew up in a Kree ship in Avengers Disassembled, not like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, it, it's interesting. I think the most interesting, I was going to say uh, Norman Osborn was most interesting when he was dead because he when when I was reading comics, when I, you know, for a Yeah, he was time, already dead. He was already dead, you know, by the time I started reading them. But that's actually not, you know, when you think about the Rain era and what was it, Hammer? I, yeah, yeah. Again, this is an opportunity to let that character evolve and to change into something else. And I haven't, I have not picked up a Spider Man book in a minute. Yeah, um, that's fair. I tend to, just full disclosure, I tend not to pick up, I, I tend to trade weight the big marquee characters. So even though Superman's not a bad idea. my all time favorites and they'll have writers on there that I love, it's Superman. He doesn't need my sales. You know what I mean? He doesn't need, yeah. there will always be a Superman book. Me buying or not buying the book is not going to change whether they put out a Superman book. Uh, mm -hmm. So I try to tend to focus on maybe either runs I love or, or characters that might not get as much love otherwise. So you know, if I'm not feeling a Spider-Man book, I'm not going to feel beholden to picking it up. So I have not followed. So Gold Goblin, I've seen the covers. That's him supposed to being, it's Norman's a good guy now. Is that what we're saying? Is yeah, that what that's 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 that's, you're saying this child murderer is now a good guy. Cool. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of like, what's really frustrating is that the Gold Goblin book that came out yeah. was good. Okay, okay. Um, that was a it, it was a good series that was really well written and approached it from the perspective of like, you don't like this guy. Mm -hmm. 
he i mean do you know how he was redeemed no is it magic okay. was it magic yeah it was magic yeah yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, i got it got it got it um do you remember that really grounded serial killer character the sin eater who, <laughs> whose whole power was he was he wore a ski mask and blew people away with a shotgun that yeah was he's what if, he's what if punisher but less likable <laughs> yeah 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 uh he uh was brought back to earth with a magical shotgun. Oh my God. That blew your sins out of your body. Oh my God. I don't like it. So right. Oh it's God. Oh no. Maybe that sounds like it a is. setup. That sounds like a setup. I would buy for a ghostwriter book. Oh, like, yeah. Hey, a new ghostwriter villain. We're bringing sin eater back, but now he has a soul gun. It's like, that sounds like a ghostwriter villain. That's a 100. Cause that you were, you just described a, a, effectively what Johnny blaze was during the Danny catch era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, he yeah, yeah. He had the shotgun, dude. That was he had my, the Hellfire uh, shotgun. Uh, Danny catches my Ghost Rider. Yeah. Johnny Blaze. Any if Johnny if Blaze I is Blaze. Pitching, if I yeah, if I was pitching Ghost Rider movie to Marvel, I'm like, bring Nicholas Cage back as Blaze and yeah. have Danny catch be your Ghost Rider. That would be the win in my book. But I'd be know, so whatever. okay with that. Yes, yeah. especially like what was it? Uh, whatever that awful movie was that Nicholas Cage made where he doesn't talk. Uh, that oh, version yeah. of him, like yeah, that, yeah. that character he played. But uh, anyway, yeah, so um, Norman Osborn got blown away by a magical shotgun that knocked his sins out of his body. And so he oh. was like, without his sin, it, it's it's a much more messy Marvel and terrible way of doing. There's a really great um, moment in one of the older Justice League stories where Martian Manhunter uses his telepathy to make Joker sane for a minute so they can ask him a question, so they can get the, uh, I believe it's the Whirlagog out of his hands. Mm-hmm. And uh, when he does, he is immediately like, what have I done? Yeah. It's really good. And it's a great moment. And then like, and, uh, and Jean can't hold it because his madness is too great. And so, you know, but three panels. Yeah. And it's endlessly memorable. Yeah. Whole ass year long arcs. And I still have to tell people about the magic shotgun. But, uh, and also, didn't we just do this with, um, what was that? What was that event that made Doctor Doom good and Deadpool, Zen and Sabretooth good? Oh, Axis. Axis. Yeah, didn't we? We couldn't have done this with the Axis. Can we? Uh, we did it no? with, Car- with, but Carnage was the Spider-Man villain we flipped with Axis. Uh, uh, oh, did they get any mileage out of? Did they try to pair off uh, Norman with Superior Spider-Man? No, it, they Missed never. Opportunity. They, they, oh. The word. Well, I mean, yeah. uh, Doc was not superior when they made oh, Norman. Of course, you could do something. You could, you could do oh, something. Oh, I know. Uh, what is oh. it? Is the new superior book a flashback alternate universe? Flashback. Is it, okay. Yeah, it's whatever. flashback and, and present day. Like the, okay. the, the duo of Ock and Pete are dealing with a problem that Ock set up when he was the superior Spider Man. Sure. And I stopped reading the book, but like one of the last issues I read, Doc Ock, uh, has double crossed Peter and he's like, I gotta get back in your body. <laughs> I'm tired of being fat. Yeah, yeah. And uh yeah, so uh but anyway Osborne he he's he's no he has he doesn't have the sins and so he's like sad. Yeah. You know, because he's like I, I don't I didn't do any work to become this now. Yeah. But I did inherit it and I'm like this. And so uh Christopher Cantwell wrote the Gold Goblin book, which was like frustratingly good. Yeah. And uh you know, well done. But like, anyway, so that's over. And, uh, but every issue where it, that wasn't in gold goblin, uh, he was like, Oh, like he was, you're like, Oh, well, when is he going to turn into the green goblin? Now? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, you know, Spider-Man needs, Spider-Man needs a n- new villain for this era, because we, yeah. we've talked about this before on spider versity, how, you know, especially in the nineties. Yes. Cause, cause in some ways venom carried the torch of what green goblin represented in the fact that he knew who peter was and yes. he had a personal grudge obviously a lot of the characteristics are very different but in those core elements and it was kind of cool to see that evolve into a new villain and i'm trying to think if peter has like who is for lack of a better way of phrasing it like who is the new venom like there was yeah what was the last time i picked up an amazing book it was that bug guy that ended up being harry and it was like harry again kindred, harry again? yes yeah kindred harry again like yeah, yeah. And, and again not to like throw everybody it wasn't just harry 
Oh, I didn't. Once I saw it was Harry, I was like, I'm good. It, it wasn't really. But Kindred was a mess. Kindred okay. was not. Kindred was supposed to be one thing. And then Marvel was like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you undoing one more day? And Nick Spencer's like, I have one more arc left. Just please let me do it. And they're like, no. No. And you have to change who Kindred is. And, you have to, and he's like, well, if I'm going to undo one thing, it'll be Sin's past. Mm -hmm. And so instead of undoing one more day, he undid Sin's past, which I do appreciate for like him doing that. But at the same time, like, woof. It was yeah. a it was a big dog of an arc, and so I just wonder like who is, I guess if there was a character that is of the era, it would be Miles. So it's not like we haven't had any new innovations on the Spider Man front. No, um, yeah, I guess maybe. Although it, it, the the key is being adapted into a beloved thing. So you know, Venom was already crazy popular, but then he was adapted in the nineties cartoon. And so it's like, you could say like Morlin, but he hasn't dropped in anything yet. They're probably saving him for Madam well, Web 2. <laughs> Mor uh, Morlin was the best new... Morlin was the Venom of the 2000s. Yeah. But uh, it was unfortunately, so whoops. <laughs> right. But, and also like diminishing returns. Like his yeah. first arc, amazing. His other, the other arc, meh. And, yeah. then, and then they were like, well, how about a whole family of Morlins? And it was like, nobody nobody's here for no this. man we didn't we love venom and we didn't even like it when we gave like a billion venom so maybe don't yeah do it Morlin. <laughs> it's true we were like we were it's weird though we had enough room in our hearts for carnage carnage yeah. came we're like all right it, and well, i think it, again and i can't stress this enough carnage only exists as an excuse to get spider-man and venom to team up it's the same thing exactly with like right. t what is it t 1000 the liquid one yeah that one great great character great performance but that character exists so that now Arnold, Arnold can be a, good, be a guy. good guy. That's yeah. the, that's the reason. <laughs> but once you get beyond that, once we've done that, it's like, do we need like, what is it? Scream, right? Or Phage? No. Yeah, and it's like, well, no, yeah. And also, and also, Carnage is great because Carnage is a, is a great riff on it. You, you need something like that to rem, to let you know that oh, Venom can be good because he's not this guy. This right. guy's off the rails. Yeah, we lowered the bar such that Venom became a good guy by default. Yeah, Venom uh, just hates Peter. There's a lot of reasons they hate Peter. Carnage is just out massacring people. This is exactly. this is a problem that needs to be stopped. Yeah. So we're getting Green Goblin back and uh, you know, what sure. is old is new again, yippee. Uh I'll, I'll read gonna, all about it from yeah, somebody what else. You do? What can you do? Yeah, what can you do with that? That's exciting. That because again, you can't top Green Go Goblin killing Gwen Stacy. No, that's that's it. That's I will the... say pretty dope when he killed Ben, because uh, I was there. I, yeah. I made sure to check in. I was like, "Oh, spectacular seventy five. This is it. This is supposed to be the end." Yeah. Green Goblin shows up. I've been alive the whole time and in Europe, yeah. and now I've killed Ben. What a what a after all the returns for Ben, I feel like his. His death in that has still never been equaled. The moment where like Pete's going to be a father in literally that issue. Yeah. Norman Osborn has come back to life. Yeah. And has done and, and can be the retcon for oh so many problems we have mm -hmm. in the Spider-Man books now. And Ben Riley dies and starts to degenerate, revealing that Peter is the real one and yeah. says, tell may about her uncle ben and mm -hmm. that's yeah. like yeah you did it yeah you just you just did the new uncle ben like this is gonna be friggin' amazing and then they were like nah no 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 yeah and it's bummer too and it's somebody like and, and it doesn't help that we've every time we've brought like they just every time they bring ben back they want to tinker with him and it's like don't don't they just, just yeah, let him, leave him let, alone let us if you're bringing him back it's for uh, us that are fans yes so just let him be scarlet spider again in another have him be spider-man in la literally that's or all west coast to do. just pick a west coast uh city that has buildings that he can swing from yes and Seattle. let spider-man there like, like i i'd take i honestly like they need to like either spider verse it or time travel it where they go back they pluck him from there and they just yeah. go like eh, we just fixed your degeneration thing like none of the baggage of the previous ben riley's yeah yeah, yeah. And, and, and truthfully i think you and i've talked about this before i i as much as we can be tired of the multiverse thing, I really don't think we've exploited it in the way that it could be most useful in that. Like I would love, guess what? Here's a, here, here's a book as, as if Ben Riley has been Spider-Man since he started to now 
Peter yes. never got it back. And that's this is an alternate reality where Ben has been Spider Man for the last da -da -da decades, and yep. now you can see how that would have played out. Uh, yeah. Similarly, I want I want a universe. I want a multiverse story where like, what if uh, Dick Grayson was still Batman? Because I yeah. don't think I don't think we got the mileage out of that. We could like there's still stories to be told there, and I'm bummed that we we jettisoned it so quickly. Yeah, yeah, agreed. There's still mileage in those stories. Uh, last story of the of the hour. Uh, Scrooge McDuck is getting his first ever comic book titled Uncle Scrooge and the Infinity Dime from Marvel. Uh, Scrooge will explore the multiverse to stop an alternate twisted Scrooge from becoming the power, all powerful and incomprehensibly rich Scrooge above all. This will be the first time that one of Disney's main characters will be the central focus of original storytelling by Marvel Comics. Okay, uh, Sal, I feel like you're lying to me because Scrooge McDuck, McDuck has been in comics before, right? Is this yeah. just the first self-titled book? Yeah, I guess. Uh, I like think it's more like, right? this is this is like, this is Scrooge McDuck's first Marvel book. Okay. Uh, I do know that it will be written by Jason Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> uh excuse me <laughs> yeah it's him as the title character not just an ensemble character that's from clarification from our producer wait Dan. a second um, but i feel like there was a long-standing well i know there was a long-standing scrooge mcduck series but a not from marvel and b uh not not like this <laughs> jason aaron sorry yeah. i'm still on that i know jason aaron <laughs> uncle scrooge dollar sign s uh and the infinity dime uh, yeah Jason Aaron scalped, right? I'm thinking of the right. That's the Jason one. Yeah. Aaron, right? Yeah. Jason okay. Aaron scalped. Yeah. Scalp Punisher, upcoming Ninja Turtles. Yeah. <sighs> wow. I mean, good. Cool. Get that, get that money. And I know I'm not a big DuckTales fan, but I know that, that there, there's a lot of love for that franchise. Yeah. Um, so sure. Sal, who do I need to talk to about when I think about beloved animated series, who do I talk to about getting a freakazoid comic? Right. Uh, I, I, it's got to be DC. And I've okay. had this conversation with DC people where I said, like, you guys own Freakazoid. What are you doing? And I've, I've been met with both, like, we've asked about it, <laughs> slash, slash, I've never even considered it. Yeah. So, like, I don't know. Um, I, I would feel like the response would be like, listen, we've got Mike Alred, who created, created Madman, doing some of our books right now. Uh, yeah. So we don't want to burn that bridge because I know oh. I know Mike Alred is not a huge fan of Freakazoid. <laughs> no, he's no. Oh, gee, I wonder why. Uh, and, yeah, because Freakazoid literally is just a like a, a sanitized madman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that listen. said, I have a lot more fondness. I like I, this is blasphemous, but like I have a lot more fondness for Freakazoid because I watched more Freakazoid than I read Madman. Yes, I appreciate what what Mike Alred was doing. I I love the Madman design and I love the concept. Yeah. But I watched a lot of Freakazoid. Watched a lot of Freakazoid. I still remember vividly. Uh, wow, I just, I just, it just blanked on the name. But like Freakazoid teams up with a, this old house guy, and his finale. And his oh, like, was it Bob Vila? No, it's not Bob Vila. It's the other guy. It's the carpenter. Oh, okay. Which, yeah, yeah. I, and I, I just named just left my brain, and I think that's the series finale of the show. Is him teaming up, uh, teaming up with that guy, and it's just one of those like, God damn freakazoid i yeah. i dude i i'm i'm right there with you i would love to see a dc like book from like th that's not even i don't want him don't put him on the justice league or something i just mean yeah, like, yeah. actually i guess he did be a titan if you're gonna make him a, M a dc character but no just do a a, a humor-based freakazoid book yeah yeah exactly and it doesn't even need to be although i wouldn't it, i wouldn't poo poo it if you put it in the same continuity but yeah. like uh you know it did. Did you see Norm the Teen Abram. Titans? Uh, okay, okay. Did you uh, did you see the Teen Titans go Freakazoid episode? No. Where he it, they got the actor and they, they oh. basically they they break into Warner Brothers and like a, a la Animaniacs they free Freakazoid. And so I love for, it. Like, I love it. God bless us. I don't watch Teen Titans go any of that stuff. And I know it's got for people the fans of the original, which I I watched the original Teen Titans animated series. Yeah, I hate it, and and I feel like it's on. It's a, just a different thing. They're just doing a different thing. Um, but God, that'd be so cool. Freakazoid. Yeah. Like, oh man, them team, and that feels totally in line. Yeah, man. Do next time you do a crisis book, throw Freakazoid in there. Yeah, and have him break right? the fall and stuff. Have him hang out with Harley Quinn. Yeah, and actually, be like, Freakazoid would be a better Deadpool than any any other book they could do. Okay, well, and also because he literally is a cartoon, and I feel yeah. like you could you could lean into that. 
I feel like we're talking for like maybe two people in the audience right now. Like, yeah, yeah who are like, like yeah, yeah. Dude, it, was... That's how you do it, man. That's how Spider Spider Verse does it. The Spider Verse movies do it. You do that's what, and I think that's what these like they're doing the new Crisis on Infinite Earths movie. Throwing Freakazoid, you're giving some people something to talk about. It just yeah. is like a one you show like, uh oh, the whole multiverse is collapsing. One shot of Freakazoid, and it's like, oh my god, they're speaking to me. <laughs> you have him team cool. up with Doctor Manhattan or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Why not throw it all? I love break it. everything. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but, but anyway, yeah, Scrooge McDuck, cool. I, you Scrooge know, McDuck is getting a book, um, and cool. it's going to be a self-referential one-shot that makes fun of the Marvel, like, Infinity Saga. Okay. that would I think that would be cooler if he, and maybe they will be doing the, it, this, if he's, like, teaming up with um, Launch, Launchpad is his own series. Uh, what was the, what, Tailspin, like, the characters from Tailspin, and he's teaming. Oh, like Baloo and stuff. Yeah, Darkwing Duck. And, mm -hmm. like, if you're going to go for it, they'll make fun of the infinite crisis or whatever infinite yeah uh, whatever. i was so disappointed yeah I, I i was so disappointed to find out that the launch pad mcquack of darkwing duck like darkwing duck is a separate universe from dark from ducktales it's not no. like a spinoff yeah and i'm like that is no that's dumb. so like dumb and it's like but it's sad because that means that like launch pad mcquack had to leave the family and go someplace else and i'm like he was never a member of the family. Yeah, we don't care about that. We don't, we don't, I don't care. care. Kids, we don't care. I was also kind of like, and it, and I think it says a lot about the media you and I consumed growing up. But I was always, I, my wife had never seen a Goofy movie. And uh, so I watched that. And I had, and I actually think it, beyond my nostalgia for it, which is there's a significant amount of nostalgia for it, beyond yeah. it, I still think it actually holds up pretty good. Oh, it's, um, it's huge. It, TikTok loves a goofy movie. Yeah. yeah. And, I and I think there's one shot of Mickey and Donald in it. And it's like, really? I do more with that. Like, there was this, uh, I know when, when my wife and I went to Disney recently in the hotel room, they've got a channel that's just the most recent Mickey cartoons. Yeah. And I was surprised to see, like, these are actually really good right uh, and it was at the same time and i want to say they share a semi-similar style to you know the relaunch of ducktales yep. and it's like and i and i want to say there's a there's a dark wing duck that shows up in that ducktales i didn't watch it but i heard about it it's like he, yeah they, oh they have a whole like no the dark wing the the ducktales new cartoon yeah essentially was like it was basically like a, a bunch of creators like us went, I'm sorry, did you say that none of the Disney afternoon shows were in, in the same universe? How about they all were in the same universe? Yeah. Why not? Like they, they world build to the point where they're like, Oh, gargoyles is part of it too. Yeah, I do. That one's a little bit of a stretch to me, but do it like, go for it. But like, they, I want to figure the, it out. It's, it's kind of cool. Kids, I want to see the kids um, that from the duck to Huey, Dewey and Louie hanging out with like Max from goof troop and the goofy oh, yeah. movie. Why not, man? That'd be great. Yeah. I want to see the rescue rangers solve a mystery for uh, Scrooge McDuck. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, <laughs> and, and what's funny is like, I'd watch that. And for all I know, they did do that stuff in the DuckTales and I didn't watch it. So they essentially did. no, it, yeah. like the, the origin, uh, cause of course, like, okay. So in, in Darkwing Duck, you know, like it's, it's this silly parody show mm -hmm. in the, in the new DuckTales show, the, real darkwing duck cartoon we watched was a show in that universe great and mm -hmm. so they're fans of dark like launchpad in that universe is a fan of the darkwing duck show and goes yeah. to meet the dude who played him and it becomes a whole thing and, 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 and they got jim cummings to play the guy who played darkwing duck on the show yeah awesome it's it's really weird and i'm like is this who is this for yeah but, and, and why am I watching it long after it was canceled? <laughs> and your and your and um uh Launchpad was in Ducktales and he was in Tailspin, right? That's what we that's what we're establishing here. No, no, he was on Ducktales and Darkwing Duck. Like, okay, yeah, Tailspin yeah. was the was the Jungle Book show, which was yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing. Okay, okay. Oh, sweet. Okay, yeah, but have him. He's a pilot, right? Have him. Yeah. You could say he was flying around with Baloo in Tailspin yes. prior to whatever. And Dude, then yeah, maybe if he went over to Darkwing, maybe he he was doing Darkwing post Scrooge, pre Scrooge. You know what I mean? I, I think. Yeah. Was... No, because yeah, I want to see. I'm just a sucker for this stuff. Like, I know. I know. Yeah. We're comfortable with stuff. Like, I want to see that. I'm like, I love yeah. it. Yeah. Like, I want to see Goslin hang out with the with Huey, Dewey, and Louie and Webby. Yeah. Yes. They're all ducks. Yeah. Let's get it. Because that's the one thing bothering me with the Goofy movie is all of them are some sort of do dogish thing. Yeah. You know, whatever Goofy is. Yes. They're all in yes. that ballpark. And it's like, yeah, but I don't want to imagine Goofy's hanging out with Mickey and Don. Like, I want to live yeah, in Yeah, of them. course. And we establish in the, at least the new DuckTales, probably in the old DuckTales too. I think it's the first episode we see Donald. Yeah. 
I don't know. They just those kids just have uncles. Do they not actually have parents? <laughs> no, they. I think that's like a plot point in that show. But like, yeah, for the original show, I, I mean, as far as I was concerned, as a kid, there yeah. was a there was this horrible uh, cartoon show. It was made just to make a toy line. It's garbage. Called James Bond Junior. Yes, I am and familiar. The, I'm yes, familiar. And, and this presupposes the concept. This is the the pitch is that James Bond Junior is James Bond's nephew. nephew. Yep, yep, yep. And I'm like, oh yeah, we love naming our nephews after our uncles. Mm -hmm. Like, and call him Junior. Junior. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that is one of James Bond's many love children. Yeah, and I, this and this because it came at a time when I was young enough that it 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 led me to believe that like James Bond had like a like. Uh, uh, Jaws was hanging out with Odd Job and stuff like right. that. He had like a ro like like Batman a rogues gallery, gallery, like Batman. Yeah. Bond does, and I'm still kind of disappointed that he doesn't. I'm still kind of disappointed that like obviously Jaws is iconic, Odd Job is iconic, but they're not like hanging out doing capers together, and that's no. disappointing to me. <laughs> yeah, I think Jaws is it at least in multiple movies. I think he's he in at least two. So yeah. that 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 suggests there is a connection. And there's um, like oh, there Blofeld's in a few, and he's played by like a different oh, yeah. actor every time. Yes. Uh, and and I'm still bummed to this day that in uh, was it? I think Batista was Inspector. Yeah. And they reveal oh, that his it? big thing. I, yeah. I don't think it was Skyfall. I think it was Spectre. I think you're right, um, Spectre. Yeah. And, and they reveal that he's a guy with like metal thumbs or something. It's like, he should just be jaw. Just have him be jaw. <laughs> yeah. Cause that's even easier to explain. Like you can have like early in the movie when they're fighting bond, like shoots him in the mouth. And so mm -hmm. when he comes back, he has a prosthetic jaw. He's jaws. Now he doesn't need to be <laughs> biting steel pipes with it. No, he can no, just be jaws. Yeah. But they were also like allergic to fun. So, yeah, man. I, and, you know. it's, and again, and that's and that's the gift of and and what people and I actually really like the Daniel Craig Bond movies. This is not me bagging on them. They're, they're well, not, they're well made films. It, yeah, Spectre is uh, probably the weakest one, but mm -hmm. um, at least Nolan, Nolan of all people. It's weird to think about now. Oppenheimer's Nolan. Yeah, was like, yeah, man, we'll do Two Face. Right. <laughs> yeah. And our grounded and grounded, like grounded, we now grounded's relative. At the time it was very grounded. You watch it now, it's like, oh, this is a Bond movie, basically. Um oh. but it's like, yeah, we'll do two face Bane. Yeah, why why not? Uh, right, you know exactly. I mean? Yeah. He, he but, gave it to us, he gave us what we wanted. Exactly. Uh my my point just being uh no, Donald is definitely he would do in Louis' father. Like, I mean okay. uh, I, I mean, I don't think that's canon, but it certainly is mine. Mm -hmm. He's just a bad father. It was just like, uh here. He's busy. I'm a longshoreman. I got no time. Yeah, I got to so do people, whimsical slapstick with with Mickey Mouse. Yeah, I will say for people who have not checked out the most recent, like the 2000s, most recent Mickey cartoons, they're actually pretty solid. They're pretty yeah. funny um, because they take a lot from more modern kind of antic stuff. But they they do some like really they really use the medium in fun ways. So, but I'm not a huge DuckTales fan. I'm not going to pick this up. I was going to say Jason Aaron. Maybe I'm not going to pick this nope, up. I, don't I, care. I couldn't yeah. care less. I'm sorry, folks, but I'm not going to get this. Uh, but, but feel free if you're curious about, you know, duck, whatever. Do you think people, uh, cause I know like I, perennially when I go into the comic shop, there's always like a Rick and Morty book or something like that. There it's is. Like, yeah. There's a Rick and Morty book. Do people pay, do people, I could just watch Rick and Morty if I wanted to, if I wanted Rick and Morty. I don't know that I Yeah, but you don't, but you have deal. to wait five years between seasons. And with this, the book just came yeah, out. I guess so. I guess so. And, the, and then with the Avatar books, and I know a lot of people love those books. And I guess maybe because I was weaned on, you know, I came up at a time when yeah. you, you'd have tie in comic books or like mm -hmm. the, the Star Wars expanded universe was the most notorious for this. Like it is canon until George Lucas makes a new movie and then it's not anymore. Oh, and so yeah. it's like, it's a tie in book. Like, well, this doesn't matter. No, no, this is <laughs> definitely like that. Like where it's like, yeah, I know that Dan Harmon apparently has to sign off on every issue, just like George Lucas signed off on every <laughs> Star Wars book. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, listen, folks, uh, we got to wrap up. So we want to thank you so much for hanging out with us. But before we go, you should go to gunplaymovie.com and help out DJ's Kickstarter campaign. And of course, go to youtube.com slash only stupid answers for more DJ. DJ, what else is going on? That's it, man. Follow me. DJ talks trash everywhere that matters. Uh, and yeah, if you want to hear Sal and I, you like me and Sal chatting, uh, check out Spiderversity at patreon.com slash only stupid answers. And every third Wednesday, we do Mutant Academy. So we just did Logan. So I think next up is oof, Dark Phoenix, I think, is the next one. Uh, on the docket. Oh, or Deadpool 2. <laughs> oh, you're, I think you're right. Deadpool, we get oh, one God. more. We get one more. They <laughs> throw us one more bone. Uh, yeah, no, Deadpool 2. Deadpool 2, I think, is the next one. 
Yeah. That, yeah, it is. It is. It is. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. So we got Deadpool two every third. So that's the third, win- whatever the third Wednesday of, of March. Uh, yes. Be, tune in for that. Almost uh, YouTube.com slash only stupid answers. Sal, where, where can they find you? <laughs> well, you should definitely go to YouTube.com slash Comic Pop and Comic Pop Returns. Uh, those are the two main hubs where Comic Pop content is uh, sold uh, yeah. for free to you uh, out there. So check those out as well. And of course, if you like uh, this stuff, go uh, to the subscribe button and click that and uh, follow us here at uh, Absolute Comics. And absolutely, for uh, for all your weekly comic book and comic book related movie, TV, etc. news. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Thanks for watching, folks.